Hello everyone. Um, this is the third and final lecture of the week um, is and this is going to be about uh, the Gudea of Lagash as I promised and his um, representations as a king in his diorite statues and the idea of royal portraiture. Um, as you remember, um, Gudea is um, a king of the second dynasty of Lagash, um, and he ruled sometime between 2150 and 2125 BCE um, in, uh, at his um, capital city of, uh, of Girso. Um, and we know that he ruled at least 11 years um, around this time. The, the specific dates of his reign are not exactly clear or agreed on by um, archaeologists and ancient historians. Um, but we know from really detailed inscriptions from his time that the capital city of Girsu, um, or ancient um, Talo, uh, was the site of a lot of his building projects. Um, during the reign, he sponsored the construction of several temples, um, within his kingdom, both in Lagash and in other cities as well, uh, both in Girsu and the other cities um, that includes Lagash, um, Alhiba, um, uh, sort of Nina, and other um, other uh, cities as well. Likewise, he also sponsored lengthy um, uh, epic uh, com compositions, literary compositions, where he was portrayed as a shepherd king, a king that cares about his flock, a king that cares, a benevolent king who cares about his people. Um, he builds for his uh, gods uh, and goddesses, divinities. Um, he's a kind of a really devotional, very devout person in his religious activities, and he's an avid builder. Of, um, of temples. Um, uh, we're particularly aware of his personality uh, because he also commissioned a, a lot of images of himself, um, uh, particularly these diorite statues, uh, numerous diorite statues. And this is kind of really interesting because it's incomparable to any other king um, that we know of really from this time. Uh, period. Really, really spectacular. Either seated statues, standing statues, um, or um, other ones. There, he's always uh, represented in some kind of a gesture of veneration and devotion. Um, his images raises us um, this raises this question: What is a portrait? Right. And so, uh, in no other king we have actually seen so much representation of a particular king with his name inscribed on it uh, that that uh, in uh, sort of appear in public contexts and temple contexts. So we're inevitably required to talk about the sort of portrait-like representation of him um, in his diorite statues. Um, so this map reminds us uh, once again the location of Girsu and Lagash in Sumer. Um, in the southern Mesopotamian plain and in, within the same canal system. Um, and um, now, well, how this kingdom is uh, really located very closely to, to trade in the Persian Gulf. Um, as I discussed in the previous lecture, um, in Lecture 8.1, that the acquisition of diorites, these diorite statues, is, is, uh, diorite is a very hard, very difficult to find um, it's kind of stone, a volcanic stone. Um, and it's, a, it's very, very precious because when you carve it, when you polish it, it becomes this kind of very sturdy and shiny and really powerful, um, sort of really dark um, image um, it creates. Um, what's really interesting is that the acquisition of diorite is associated with copper mining, and copper mining was very important for these early kings, um, and that was being done actually in Magan and Dilmun along the Gers uh, Persian Gulf. Um, and what's really interesting is that these places also, geologically speaking, offered uh, sources of diorite, and so 
Um, my general understanding is that whenever a king actually was mining copper, they were also bringing diorite um, uh, sort of from those places because they, they overlapped. And so I have a sense that, that maybe ancient Mesopotamian communities might actually have that association really powerful in the sense that when you see someone's statue, someone's diorite statue, you immediately understand copper mining, that, that this king in fact uh, controls the mining of copper in that particular area because he's able to bring diorite and have his statues carved um, in that way. Um, and so this is, of course, a little conjecture. Uh, but the fact that actually uh, Gudea talks about mining copper in a lot of these statues um, and really going to Dilmun and Magan, um, then that actually makes us really think about this connection. The site of Girsu, modern Tello, was excavated by French archaeologists at the, um, at the end of the 19th century, between 1877 to 1933, uh, in various phases of, of projects. Uh, but this, um, this project was actually, French um, uh, archaeologists are not really great, um, particularly at this time period with stratigraphy and with architectural documentation. So these um, excavations actually really suffered with a kind of a, um, uh, a kind of uh, really uh, quality of excavation. The scientific quality of the excavations were a little lacking. So a lot of these statues were found, um, uh, but their find contexts are not recorded really well. I'm showing you one uh, sort of particular Hellenistic palace, the palace of Ada, Ada Nadinahe, where uh, in that area with a black gate, uh, they found a number of about 10 of these Gudea statues. But unfortunately, we really don't know um, very well the archaeological context in which these statues were excavated. Um, this is the ancient Mesopotamian uh, a sculpture gallery in the Louvre Museum. So a lot of these sculptures, um, about 30 of them that were excavated in this area were transported to the Louvre Museum, which houses these Gudea statues um, collected by the French archaeologists. And you can see the incredible abundance of um, different kinds of Gudea statues, some only heads, uh, some uh, full bodies, some uh, bodies with missing heads, some seated statues, and so on. Um, how are we supposed to explain, um, given the small scale and political impact of Gudea, right? He, he lived, he was a ruler for about 11 years. And in, in other accounts, we don't really, we don't see this kingdom as being having a huge uh, uh, impact, uh, political impact or economic impact. How do we explain this kind of really abundance of art production? Somehow we need to um, sort of find an, uh, an understanding of this. Um, so each of these statues were actually named um, and understood distinctly as different personalities. So they were considered animate beings um, and even were exposed to ceremonies such as the mouth opening ritual um, or feeding or anointing and baiting um, and so on. So the statues were understood to be performative beings, live beings, animate beings, um, rather than just a simple dead representation of the king. So that's absolutely, that's not how Mesopotamians really understood it. This standing statue of uh, Gudea, uh, its head is missing, but inscribed with the inscription um, in the front with a calligraphic, beautifully laid out Sumerian text that says uh, the lady who makes firm decisions for heaven and earth, named to mother of the gods, let Gudea, who built the house, have a long life. Um, this is how he named the statue for her sake, and he brought it to her into her house. Um, so it, it, is, uh, it includes the name of the statue. It includes the, uh, how it's um, actually brought in. Um, and how to whom it is um, dedicated to. 
So, um, secondly, these texts um, actually also have magical functions uh, of uh, protecting, safeguarding, and also animating the sculpture, um, not just giving information. So they're not like a museum plaque where you go and read information about a statue. Uh, these, uh, these texts are actually not giving you information about the statue, but it is actually protecting, it's indexical. Um, so the relationship of Gudea, um, the king, to the diorite statues is really quite interesting. It's not um, in this kind of form of representation and um, in the uh, in the kind of Western art sense, um, but this this relationship is indexical. That actually the statue as a being, as an alive being, it is an extension of, of Gudea's personhood. It's, an, it's a distribution of Gudea's per personhood um, that actually acts on his behalf within a temple space. Um, as Zemir Bahrani explains here uh, in her chapter in, the, in our textbook on the Gudea sculpture, um, she suggests that in Western history of art, there's the idea of portrait is really based on this idea of likeness of the sitter to the pictorial or visual representation. So it's a kind of a really based on a naturalistic uh, likeness and naturalistic representation uh, resemblance. Um, but this naturalistic resemblance were actually less of a concern for Mesopotamian artists. Um, but certain ideal features, uh, for example, the king's willingness to listen to the, to the people, that's why he had big ears, right? And so his strength, and his, uh, his strength, because that's why he has like these strong arms, um, and his, um, his attentiveness, um, that's why we, there is this attention to his hands um, that are carved in great detail that actually... Uh, speaks to his de uh, devotedness um, and so on are all represented in this kind of realist cultural design elements um, and it, um, even though this image really did look like Gudea, um, Zeynep Bahrani refers to these as more encoded physiognomies, encoded physiognomies, uh, meaningful signs on the body that are less um, working with natural likeness, natural resem naturalistic resemblance, but more with these kind of conceptual, um, uh, conceptual, conceptually powerful features that actually show up in his body. So if you actually talked about a, a kind of a naturalistic likeness, um, like a Renaissance portrait artist would think, I um, think the Mesopotamian artists would, would laugh at that and they would, they would find it simplistic and silly. Um, they were more interested in, in kind of really a kind of a conceptual representation of, um, of Gudea and communicating these virtues um, which are actually talked about and, and the texts actually talk about the strong armed Gudea um, not because he's really physically strong, but he is strong because he's the king and he's actually able to mobilize that strength for being a king. And that makes him a good king or a strong, a powerful king. Um, as I mentioned before, um, Gudea also sponsored many lengthy royal inscriptions, compositions inscribed on monumental clay cylinders, as we see on the left, uh, cylinder A and cylinder B. Um, and they, these uh, two commemorate um, Gudea's building projects of various temples dedicated to Ningirsu, the gods in, um, in uh, and other gods in Girsu. These inscriptions give us a remarkable understanding of notions of kingship, but also a fascinating detail on the, uh, on the building arts. Um, for example, this famous seated statue of Gudea uh, uh, is in um, the Lourdes Museum. It's about 93 centimeters high, so it's a pretty tall, kind of life-size statue. Um, has a tablet on his lap, which uh, has a drawing of an architectural plan 
of a temple on it with an inscription. This is quite extraordinary as it shows that the architects at the, at the time um, did produce and work at, at a certain ex, to a certain extent with architectural drawings um, in building their, their uh, structures, buildings, temples particularly. And the plan sits on Gudea's lap, um, uh, has also annotations of measurements and kind of really names of gates and so on. It's marked as the enclosure of the sanctuary of Nin Girsu at Girsu, um, and it's called A Ninu. So we know exactly what it is, um, and how. Um, so we see uh, some external buttresses, some kind of towers at the entrance to to the compound, and so on. Uh, the inscription on the statue. Um, on his skirt that you can see um, tells us that Gudea brought the diorite from Magan, modern Oman, and sculpted it into the form of a stone statue. Um, he named it, For my Lord, I built his house, life is my reward. Um, that's the name of the statue. And he brought it to him, to Ininu. Uh, Gudea gave word to the statue. This is kind of really Gudea made the statue speak, um, therefore. So we also learn that this plan um, that is on his lap was actually revealed to Gudea uh, in his dream. Um, so uh, that was kind of a really a secret in his dream by gods. And so this was kind of a really a secret plan. Um, uh, before it was established. Um, so, similar architectural plans are known from uh, uh, the same time period. This is uh, a, a, um, a, uh, an architect's plan of a temple um, that is uh, dated to the 2100 BCE, also in the Lure Museum. Um, what's really fascinating is that there are these small inscriptions within each room that actually articulates the size of that room as well. Um, and we know that these plans were also used for real estate sales and so on, uh, making contracts um, as well. I'd like to wrap up my lecture with these images. Um, these are, the one on the left is a limestone fragment of a stele, which was discovered in Tello and uh, identified by its inscription as a stele of, uh, of Gudea, where Gudea is being presented to a seated or enthroned god or goddess. Um, and on the right, um, and, and so he's being presented with uh, a kind of a, a various different deities. You can see you can see their um, sort of um, crowns, horned crowns. So those are those those are actually insignia of the of um, of deities, um, uh, divinities. Uh, and so the Gudea is actually coming in the very back. He's the kind of small guy at the end of the of the procession. Um, and then uh, on the right uh, are some foundation deposits um, of Gudea in the form of nails, uh, inscribed nails, which were presumably used in order to mark the corners of the temple when the architects are actually laying out the design of the building. So those ceremonial nails um, that were used in the construction of the temple are then buried in the foundations of the temple to protect that temple but also to create an archive of that, um, of that construction moment. So this completes uh, the third lecture of, uh, of this week, and I look forward to our discussion of all these things uh, on Thursday. So thank you.